All right, so now we ask, what does Earth look like from 200 miles up in space? 200 miles, 250 miles, it's the distance from New York to Washington, D.C. When you're a couple of hundred miles up, you will see Earth below you turning, passing 18 sunrises a day, but you don't see the entire Earth. Okay, so how do you see the entire Earth? You have to leave Earth, go somewhere, the moon, Mars, beyond. And so the book opens with this quote from Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. He says, you develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. He's feeling it. That's a cosmic perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm Larry Weeks, and this is The Bounce Podcast. There is a mental exercise that the Stoics of ancient Greece and Rome practiced called the view from above. They thought that the individual must be viewed as part of the whole universe, not as something isolated from the rest of nature. So to practice this technique, you imagine yourself from a third-party perspective, zooming out from where you are, going higher and higher from your house to your neighborhood, your city, then the planet, and you, you're seeing yourself smaller and smaller, right out to the stars. And this is an effort to remind ourselves how small our troubles really are in the grand scheme of things. It all becomes pretty small when you're looking at Earth from outer space. Well, it's my privilege to have on the podcast someone who spent his life helping all of us take that view from above. My guest is the renowned astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil is the Frederick P. Rose Director of the Hayden Planetarium at New York's American Museum of Natural History. He is the author of 15 books, many of them international bestsellers, including the number one bestseller, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. And his most recent book is Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. Neil is also the host of the Emmy-nominated podcast, Star Talk, as well as two seasons of Cosmos, televised by Fox and National Geographic. He has also received 21 honorary doctorates as well as NASA's Distinguished Public Service Medal. The man has an asteroid named after himself for heck's sake, and <laughs> I'm very grateful he took the time to chat with me. On the show, we focus on the book Starry Messenger, and we discuss cosmic perspectives and what that means. We also talk about the history and impact of space exploration. We revisit the moon landing. He talks about the allegory of the cave. Uh, his view of the Mars missions and future space exploration. We talk about space as supply chain, uh, the solar system as a possible backyard, his personal vision for the future. We talk about how to think scientifically on scientific consensus and what to do in its absence. I referenced the pandemic when what we knew about COVID was constantly in flux. We talk about the social importance of probability, his views on God and faith, we talk about UFOs, aliens, and a review of the Fermi Paradox. We get his views on artificial intelligence and on the new generative AIs. And then we, we get into some fun stuff like science fiction movies, his favorite time travel movie, his one conspiracy theory, and many other topics. I think you'll really enjoy this episode, not only for the incredibly interesting topics we discuss, but if you pay attention to how Neil talks about these subjects— and even parses my questions, it's a mini class on thinking through a subject. Uh, he's very circumspect, being careful to consider all the possible answers and the consequence of those answers. Uh, but there's no dodge. He, he waits facts over opinions. And where there's little to no evidence, he says, I don't know. And if he speculates, he's very clear that he's speculating. And he does all this while being very engaging and even funny. So he's great. And without further ado, here's Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil, thank you for taking the time. Welcome to the show, man. I'm going to jump right in because mm -hmm. I feel like there's a rare bird outside in the tree that uh, oh, I, okay. <laughs> I don't know how long I can keep it, but uh, very excited to talk to you. And in, in researching you and digging further than I have before because preparing to, to talk with you, I discovered you were a wrestler and, and then I saw that you were on a ballroom dance team. And the reason that interests me is because I used to ballroom dance, and I'm like, okay, I've got a hook in. I've, I, he, Neil's more relatable to me now. He's more. He's not. 
You no, no, we were labeled are. because we're you're, both humans on Earth made of stardust. Oh, you're jumping that's why, right. <laughs> that's why we're relatable. It's the you don't need the ballroom dancing. The, uh, unnecessary. So you want a gold medal, right? Then I yeah. saw you want a gold medal. I'm like, okay, now he he's again out of my league. But real quick question: favorite ballroom dance? Did you have a favorite? So I'll just I tell like you the rump, uh, no, I like the pasa doble because this is a, it was an international Latin ballroom was the style. Oh. And so, you know, there's a lot of other, a lot of other styles of ballroom, you know, there's their jazz variants, but this one is Latin ballroom. And my favorite was the Paso Doble only mm. because of what it represented and how beautifully it captures it, where the man doesn't do much moving, kind of stands there and sways his hips, feet typically sort of planted in the ground. Or if you move your feet, they get replanted in the next position meanwhile the woman is like dancing back and forth left and right of the man with usually there's a skirt that flares out this dance form is inspired by the matador and his cape and i just thought that was such a a beautiful construct that here's this cultural icon the matador the cape and so when I create a dance out of it, and the cape is always flipping back and forth, getting and diverting the attention of the bull. And this is the woman as the man maneuvers the woman back in front of him and behind him. So for me, that was the most intriguing and interesting of the dances. Very cool. So I'm going to mm -hmm. use your book, uh, Starry Messenger, as kind of a launch pad for a chat. And then as a touchstone to agree, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to veer off the question. Go wherever you got to go. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I, well, I'm and a servant of thing. your interests, so think of it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Because okay. I was looking, I'm like, well, he, Neil has talked about everything and anything, so I, I, I'm fine. I can go anywhere, I think. But the subtitle to me captures it, I think, the cosmic perspectives on civilization. And I was going to ask you if anybody has ever created curriculum or if you have using astrophysics to kind of teach fundamentals of life skills, but this book kind of delves into that. In fact, you go into values exploration, but the cosmic perspectives, you, you have readers looking at, or you had me looking at kind of all these debated topics, things that are, you know, uh, or most discussed topics through this cosmic lens. And I thought of the movie Dead Poet Society. I thought of the, the character Robin Williams plays this English teacher in the 50s when he, in the classroom scene where he, he gets up on the desk Right. And he says well, the movies must... from the 90s, but takes place in the 50s, I think. Right. Right. Yeah, he, right. He jumps on the desk and he, he says, hey, we need a different perspective. We need a different way of looking at things. You're you're Professor Keating here. Right. You want us to to get on top of your desk and, and look around. Am I right? Yeah. Well, it's it's a again, I, I think of myself as a servant. So here's the world with the conflict and turmoil and disagreement magnified, exacerbated, certainly by social media platforms. and as a scientist, when I watch this unfold, I'm so disappointed in the absence of objective truth and rational thought that informs these conversations. And opinions are just fine to have, but if they're based on something that's just false, objectively false, or based on something that you want to be true but isn't, then you ought to revise how you're thinking about the world. So there's the scientific lens, lens of science literacy that reveals the world to look different to you, but add to that a cosmic perspective where we're all kind of in this together. It's quite a potent uh, posture to take when looking at and analyzing all that divides us in the world. And so that book, apart from the, the personal anecdote that infuse occasional chapters, everything I say there could completely be written and communicated by practically any other scientist in the physical sciences, and especially by any one of my colleagues as astrophysicists. So there's not, I didn't pull some perspective out that no one ever imagined before. No, we walk around with this point of view. But as scientists, and if you're active as a research scientist, you don't have the time or the interest to bring it to the public. That's not your job. Your job is to get in the lab or get back to the telescope and uncover the secrets of the universe. So I sit at that intersection where I have the insights and perspectives that all my colleagues have, but I also have insights and perspectives as an educator about what might be the best ways to communicate it. And this book, for me, 
is the pinnacle of that. So I want to talk about scientific thinking and and you because you discuss personal versus objective truth, but you also mention things like the overview effect that astronauts experience when they go into space and they have this, some of them have what seems to be a kind of life-changing perspective shift. Some astronauts report this feeling of oneness and connection. Is that part of this cosmic perspective you're trying to get across? No, so the overview effect is a subset of the cosmic perspective. So let's put this in context. Generally, when we say astronauts go into space, what we mean by that is that they go into low Earth orbit. And low Earth orbit is a couple of hundred miles above Earth's surface. Anyone who does that today is boldly going where hundreds have gone before. All right, so now we ask, what does Earth look like from 200 miles up in space? 200 miles, 250 miles, it's the distance from New York to Washington, D.C. L.A. to San Francisco is farther than they are up in, quote, space. But that matters from what I'm about to say, because when you're a couple of hundred miles up, you will see Earth below you turning, passing 18 sunrises a day, but you don't see the entire Earth. Okay, so how do you see the entire Earth? You have to leave Earth, go somewhere, the moon, Mars, beyond. And so the opening quote to Starry Messenger is not from an astronaut who orbited 200 miles up. It's from an Apollo 14 astronaut who viewed Earth from the moon. And that perspective is not something that comes naturally out of this overview effect. The overview effect is you're, you're high up enough and you don't see national borders and things. And there's Earth and all of the troubles on Earth disappear because you're too far away from them to see them in detail. And it changes your perspective on Earth. Now go to the moon. And I, I memorized the quote. I'll recite it here. The book opens with this quote from Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. He says, you develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty, you want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. He's feeling it. <laughs> That's a cosmic perspective where Earth shrinks in the distance and it is alone, adrift, in the vacuum of space, as Carl Sagan poignantly put in his pale blue dot, uh, with no hint with no hint that help will come from anywhere else to save us from ourselves. So yeah, an overview effect is a subset. You get that en route to the cosmic perspective. And by the way, do I have a cosmic perspective? You're damn right I do. Not because I've been to the moon, but because I think about the universe all the time. And as do any of my colleagues, we imagine being in space, what the stars are doing, how they're orbiting the galaxy, how galaxies are orbiting galaxy clusters, how the universe is expanding. So actually going into space might add a an emotional touch to it, but intellectually, no, we're all there. Reading the book made me revisit kind of our space travel, uh, the space age and our trip to the moon and what have you. And there were some insights there I just, you know, was never aware of. And the reason this is important because there is some controversial swirl about funding you know, space travel, resources, billionaires now going into space or commercializing space flight. And by the way, well, often what someone says is controversial are people arguing without foundational grounds for that argument. So it is rare that I will call something controversial <laughs> because <laughs> you know what controversial should be? It should be given that there is climate change, do we help industries break in with tax abatements or do we put tariffs on international trade you can have a, a good healthy political debate about that and again i wouldn't call it controversy let's just call it debate we don't have an agreement on something controversy is this is bad don't do that it's bad it will hurt you it will that's when i think of controversy but most things actually succumb to many things succumb to rational analysis and that's what the book tries to highlight for people well, please keep me on the rational track here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think of the funding of space exploration as controversial. You can debate it, but I don't think it's as controversy. 
I, I just want to, I, I, I want to reserve no, words point. for Please. the precision for which they're invented. Please. Yeah. Keep me on track. So personally, I, you know, I was thinking about prior to the book and prepping here for talking to you, should we commercialize space? I, you know, I, this is a debate in my head and like, is this just, is this too risky? So on and so forth. I, I kind of leaning, what's the point? But as I was reading your book and, and thinking this through, like, for instance, you bring up, first, you, you paint this story about cave dwellers, our ancestors 30,000 years ago, debating about- <laughs> Thank you for remembering that. De yes. Debating about, in their own way, around a fire, should they explore outside the cave or the, explore beyond their small world, right? The world is very small in their mind. They, you know, there's so much un unexplored territory out there. But basically, the point was, sometimes you have to leave the cave to solve your cave problems. Yeah, because just um, imagine that conversation with the cave elders and the young, the young and the curious go to the cave elders and say, we want to go outside the cave door. We took a look because the door was ajar, or if, if cave doors had hinges, I don't know. And so <laughs> they go to the elders and they, and they say, no, we have cave problems. We must save the cave, solve the cave problems first before we leave the cave. That's what it sounds like to me. When people say we have problems on Earth, why are we exploring space? Do you realize how tiny Earth is compared with the universe? And to think and believe the Earth is tinier compared to the universe than the cave is compared to the rest of the Earth. So the argument is only magnified when you take it to the space analogy relative to the cave. But there are many other reasons, but that's, the, that's sort of the cave uh, entry level rebuttal to that comment. There was this watershed moment with the moon landing that I hadn't thought of, that you list all these events that happened after the moon landing. All those events that I listed, which were very, very green in their, in their intent and in their movement and in their caring for Earth as a planet, they all happened while we were walking on the moon. And so the concentration of legislation, agencies, organizations, the marketing, that landed between 1968, when we first arrived at the moon, and 1972. And I throw in an extra year there because we were still thinking that we would continue to the moon. The program would ultimately get canceled under Nixon. But the point is, there was a focus of those activities. That's in those years, we saw the first Earth Day. We saw the the founding of the Environmental Protection Agency. We saw the founding of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. In there in 1968 was the whole Earth catalog that would then rapidly use that first image of Earthrise from the moon taken in December 1968 by Apollo 8. And by the way, that year was, by many measures, the bloodiest year in the bloodiest decade that American America had experienced in a hundred years since the Civil War, with our two assassinations stateside, the ramp up in Vietnam, uh, we had the most American deaths in 1968 uh, of any other year in Vietnam. We had a lot of other distractions: Cold War, Hot War. Yet, while we were going the moon, we took the time to care about Earth. It's an extraordinary juxtaposition as though a kind of a firmware upgrade had descended from space into us. If you ask people then, oh, yeah, of course we meet an Earth Day. It's the right thing to do. That's why I called it a firmware upgrade, because I don't think people were consciously aware of the power of that photo on them. They knew it. You saw it. It's kind of you stare at it, not just the moon landing, but the first arrival at the moon. Apollo 8 didn't land on the moon. They went to the moon and orbited and took that photo of Earthrise over the moon. And like I said, that photo was used for the whole Earth catalog. It, what, it was that and a, the, the Apollo 17 photo of the full Earth, because that Earth is, a, is like a gibbous Earth. The Apollo 17, which is a full Earth, these are images used for the Earth Day flag. All right, It has many variations over the decades, but that was among them. So Apollo program, even though we sent mostly military pilots and folks, you know, they played golf and drove a buggy. They brought back some dirt. Okay, can you actually put a price on the impact it had on our species all of a sudden deciding to care about Earth? Before that, people cared about local problems, like if there was an industry polluting your river or your lake, that was a concern, and it was a local concern, but no one was stepping back 
and thinking globally. We even had, going back 100 years, the movement to protect our national parks. I forget which president that was. It wasn't Roosevelt, but he was a, a supporter of it. And again, that's a local thing. It's our parks, not the Earth's ecosystem. All right. Oh, by the way, also in those years was the a Comprehensive Clean Air Act, a Comprehensive Clean Water Act, and an endangered species legislation was put into play. There were variants of this earlier on, but in terms of how how thoroughly those renewed versions of them would affect what we do and how we do it, there was no contest from before. And also, I forgot, it was in 1972 or 73, we would ban leaded gas, realizing that lead is bad in the, for the environment, and we would ban DDT. All of that it, over that five-year period. Just so, so, sure. so what's that worth to you to say, well, why are we going into space when we have problems on Earth? Oh, my gosh. The fact that we went into space, you know, we went to the moon to explore the moon, looked over our shoulders, and discovered Earth for the first time. What's that worth to you? Even that that crying Indian public service announcement, remember him? Yes. Where people threw trash out the window, and he turns around and you see a tear, holding aside that he's of Italian ancestry, which you could do back then, I guess. <laughs> we, <laughs> we can't do that today. But he, uh, you know, he turns around and says, a tear. We all know that. Even people born decades after it know that public service announcement. That was in 1970. And 1970 wasn't the first year we were throwing trash out our windows on the freeways. We've been doing that for decades. I'm assuming then you you feel positively about uh, a mission to Mars or exploration of that type. I can't predict this in advance, nor could you have predicted, for example, in 1920, that the brilliant minds of leading physicists thinking about atoms and molecules would lead to the discovery of quantum physics, which 50 years later would be the foundation of our entire information technology revolution. There is no creation, storage, and retrieval of, inf of digital information without the exploitation of the quantum. And so no one could have predicted that. But what we can predict is that if you maintain an active presence on a research and exploration frontier, it's hard to imagine how that won't come back and improve civilization in some highly tangible way. If not immediately, then perhaps decades later. But I don't want to pretend to know how and why that could happen. There's a chapter in the book, Exploration and Discovery, which profiles 150 years, 1870 to 2020, the, the pace of exploration and discovery in the world, especially in the United States, because we came of age kind of after the Civil War and especially after the Second World War, often leading the world in important innovations. There's a certain, I don't dare I call it recipe for that, is the free exchange of information. There's valuing what that is without people saying, don't do that because we need that. If someone wants to go there and bring their creativity to it, to stop that is to pinch off what could be major discoveries that when cross-pollinated with other branches of exploration could transform civilization. So yes, if you fund it all, if you want to society to progress the way it has, if you don't, or you don't care, I'm not, it's a democracy. I don't lead movements. I don't try to get people to do things they don't want to do. Instead, as an educator, I will say, all right, have you thought about it this way? Have you considered this information? So that when you formulate your opinion, it has an authentic foundation on which to invest your emotional energy. And if not, then maybe you should rethink it. And then I go home and then come up with whatever opinion you want, be it about investments in space or otherwise. Do you have a personal vision for humanity's future in space? What we might discover, create, become? Well, yeah, simple. When I say my vision, it's not like I'm, again, I, I don't tell people what to do. I just offer them perspectives that will help them inform what they think we should do because we're in a democracy. And I value that fact or, or republic, right? Representative democracy. So here's what I would suggest. Imagine what the world would be if we turn the solar system into our backyard. It already is our backyard, but a backyard that we have explored. 
And if you explore it, you realize, oh my gosh, we have asteroids that are rich in what today we describe as rare earth elements. There are asteroids that are chock full of such ingredients. There, we have a shortage of potable water. There are comets, single comets that have as much water in them as exists in all the world's oceans. So what's interesting to me is if the solar system becomes our backyard, we would have access to resources that historically have been the cause of some fraction of our warfare between and among ourselves throughout the history of civilization. That would be war over access to limited resources. So if the solar system is part of that supply chain, that would get rid of an entire category of warfare, just starting there. Meanwhile, let's say you are mining an asteroid, and I say, oh, by the way, since you know how to get to an asteroid and you know how to poke around in it, we just discovered an asteroid that's headed towards Earth. Could you go up to that and deflect it for us, please? And then you'll save civilization from the fate that the dinosaurs confronted 65 million years ago. You know if they had a space program, they would have deflected that asteroid that the size of Mount Everest. So then they'd still be here. So if you ask, do I have a vision? Uh, I don't want to strong arm people into this vision, but I'd like to say why this vision would have great value to the future of civilization. Throughout history, I, we've associated spirituality and myths and religions with the sky and space and hell constellations are named Orion and you have the Apollo rocket, Gemini and Artemis. Sometimes I wonder if, if space travel is actually the fruition of our religious seeking, right? You know, the, the three blind men writ large trying to figure out the night sky, you know, the setting sun, the rising moon. And plus it, you know, we just talk about the boon to our spirits by, you know, the overview effect and other things. With all your exploration of the universe and what have you is, I'm agnostic, but where do you fall on the spectrum of belief in God or higher power? I basically don't have beliefs, or let me put it another way. What I believe to be true is only ever stoked by the measure of evidence in, in support of it. And by evidence, I'm a scientist. So there's a quality and quantity of evidence that a scientist seeks that is typically a higher bar than most people I have found. Um, most people don't really know what evidence is. They'll say, I met a guy who has high rank and he told me he was picked up by aliens. That's perfect evidence. No, it's not. Is the person human? Okay, so they're susceptible to human to human limitations in their capacity to recount information, to retell information, to what the state of mind was at the time they encountered. So evidence is different when a scientist uses the term. So on that scale, essentially all of what religions say about a man in the sky with a beard, typically illustrated that way, who creates the universe and looks over your every daily affairs. I don't see sufficient evidence in that to make that a part of my life's system of decisions and, and operations and values. I, I just okay. don't see it. Part of it is many religions come with a whole retinue, retinue of instructions, who you can love, who, what you should eat, on what day of the week, what you're doing on each day of the week. So it's not just a higher power. It's a higher power completely detailing what you should do in your everyday life. And so if you're deistic in, instead of sort of religious, you, is it deistic? Is that the right word? Theist, deistic. Then you would say that a God created the universe and then we're, it's unfolding as however it does. Right. So that would be still invested in a deity, but not then assuming that the deity communicated its intent through the pen of a human in a holy book written thousands of years ago, or in some cases just hundreds of years ago, with Mormonism and, and Scientology and Christian science and some other branches of faith. So my my only point is that that would be considered Spinoza's God. So Spinoza was a a Jewish philosopher who's actually excommunicated from Judaism. He, not many people, that doesn't happen to many people in Judaism, but he was content to imagine that the laws of physics that you measure in the universe are the manifestations of God. And 
again, that's a very different sort of place to put your thinking and beliefs than to say that same God tells me who I can have sex with and when. So before I leave space, I want to ask you about aliens. <laughs> so sure. Fermi's paradox, the physicist Enrico Fermi asked the question, if extraterrestrial life exists, where is everybody? What's your view as to intelligent life beyond Earth? So Fermi's paradox, the shortened version of it, which you just gave, misses a very important calculation that he did to justify that question. Because anyone could really ask that question, but he did a calculation. Calculation was looking at evolution on Earth to make humans, how long it took us to get technology. He said, if that's representative, then we might have intelligent life on other planets. And after how much time they'll build a rocket and then colonize a neighboring planet. Well, how long will that take? Well, let's say they don't quite reach the speed of light, but maybe 20% the speed of light. So you'll get to a star five year, light years away in 25 years, All right? That's not that long. How long to cross the galaxy? Galaxies 100,000 light years across, you're going one fifth the speed of light, would take you a half a million years. The universe has been around for billions of years. His calculations suggested that if you colonize a planet and then from that colonize two other planets, and from those you colonize two other planets, you go from one to two to four to eight, 16, 64, et cetera, 32, 64 that you would completely colonize the galaxy on an evolutionary timescale. And given how old the universe is, where are they? They should have shown up already. That's the background of that calculation. And people tried to come up with good answers for that. I have a couple of ones that I happen to like, which is if you are really that expansionist, then ultimately you will be the seeds of your own demise. Because we each, I need some planets. Well, you want some planets. So we go out and get our planets and then we pass those genes on to our descendants and they want planets too. There'll be a point where we each want the same planet because our territories will overlap and we will go to war over it. Oh, that already happened on Earth. We had the Spanish Empire, the French, the Dutch, the British. They're trying to conquer the world. They end up fighting each other. So maybe... The urge to be everywhere is incompatible with the likelihood of staying alive to accomplish that goal. That's an intriguing one for me. Or just space is too hard to traverse, no matter future technologies. Or they've actually came upon Earth, saw all of our space debris, and say, oh, this is a, this is like a trash can. <laughs> Let's move on. Wanna... <laughs> NASA right. has web pages where you can see the tracked debris that is orbiting Earth right now. It's pretty embarrassing. You think there's life out there that just... Is, well, if you study a... the problem, there's no reason to think there isn't. Okay. The, given the age of the universe and the yeah. ingredients of life, which is very common, the time that's been available, our number of exoplanets that we've put in the catalog is rising through 5,000. 27 years ago, there was one. Now there's thousands that will continue to grow. So the idea that we're alone in the universe, if you continue to think that, it's being driven by some point of philosophy that's not anchored in objective reality. It's anchored okay. in a religion or some other philosophy that requires humans be uniquely special in the universe. So let's say we're not alone, but you don't think they visited. I, I, don't I think see, I've heard I don't you talk about I, yeah, I think you have heard you talk about the onset of the cell phone, smartphone. As soon as that was widely adopted, all the visitation pictures started dropping. And, and yeah, 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 we don't have any pictures <laughs> of people getting abducted or being invited onto a flying saucer. Everyone has a camera today. So we don't want to have to rely on your eyewitness testimony because in the court of science, eyewitness testimony is the lowest form of evidence you could possibly bring forth. So lights in the sky is not evidence of visiting aliens. If you can't explain the lights in the sky, you just, then you can't explain it. This kind of bleeds over into the topic of personal truth and objective truth. I want to talk to you about scientific thinking and, and help me help us uh, think more scientifically. So here's the joke. 4,000 astrophysicists walk into a casino and nothing happens. So you have the story in the book 
I think this happened in 1986. Is that right? Yeah, 1986. Yeah. So the American Physical Society, which is way bigger than the subset among them who are astrophysicists, American Physical Society has materials physicists and particle physicists, the whole retinue of all the branches of physics are represented among them. And they have an annual meeting where everybody shows up and have, have lectures and, you know, student talks and this sort of thing. And it was scheduled to do it in San Diego. San Diego has become quite the convention city. That's where the annual Comic-Con is held, most famous among the Comic-Cons. But there was a snafu with the hotels. I don't remember the details of that. I was active at the time, but I wasn't paying close attention. They had to switch cities. And on a short, relatively short notice for a conference of that size. And MGM Marina, today the MGM Grand at Las Vegas said, we'll take you at the time. And today, still one of the largest hotels in the world in terms of numbers of rooms. And they said, we'll take you. And so they said, they, so they pivoted, went to Las Vegas. And a week later, it was a news headline that said, physicists in town, lowest casino take ever. <laughs> they just knew the probabilities, you know, the math. Well, you, well, you know that you're likely going to lose. That's the whole business model of a casino. But it's not just that awareness. I go into that story because I hypothesize with, I think, very good evidence that our brain is simply not wired to think probabilistically or statistically about anything. We're not good at it. Then I look back on the branches of math that have been discovered over the centuries. You know, early on, there's like geometry and algebra and then trigonometry and group theory. And then, you know, early 1700, late 1600, there was calculus. Then you get into the 1700s and then, oh, someone says, I think it would be a good idea to take an average of numbers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the first time someone took an average of numbers. Why did it take so long? It must not be native within us. And it's so not native that entire industries have arisen to exploit how non-native that thinking is. And they're called casinos. Why is it that probability is not taught in schools as a, as a fundamental, as an elective at school? Or the lottery. You know, K, or the lottery, K through 12, yeah. right? It's to, if it's there, it's an elective. But it's not a fundamental part of what anybody does. Now, if you'll grant me one conspiracy theory, I just want permission for one. Okay. You got it. Okay. Uh, the state lottery. Do you know where most of the revenue goes from that in most states? Um, edu <laughs> education. <laughs> it goes into education, which helps you justify supporting the lottery because you know the oh, revenue. I okay. See, yeah. So my conspiracy theory is in order to keep people buying lottery tickets, they have to prevent you from understanding how bad your odds are. That's a Netflix series. That's next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so the physicists just simply didn't play. In all my years of school, I've had probability and statistics for probably seven of them. It's not just something you learn in one semester and say, okay, I'm good now. No, we, we, it is hammered in all ways and means mm -hmm. and how you use it and different ways you invoke it and how to spot when someone else has not done their homework. W w would that be the foundation that you would offer to, for, to, to think more scientifically? Just That'd be a math, start. probability? A oh, start, okay. yeah, in school systems. Yeah, I'm not blaming people for this. The school system doesn't teach it. School system doesn't teach what it really means to think scientifically. You get a book and you learn some facts and they're bold-faced words that you memorize and you get tested on that for vocabulary and then you spit it all back for your final. Then you move on to the next class, maybe never opening the book again. Somewhere in there, we need to be taught what science is, how and why it works, and why science literacy is your vaccine against charlatanism in the world. People who would exploit your ignorance of how the world works because you didn't know how the world actually works. Uh, so it's, it's really an inoculation. So then I would assume in regards to the stock market, you would do index funds versus stock picking. No, unless okay. you have knowledge about it. You, know, you, okay. can, you can vote your, what you love. You can say, I like this brand. I like this product that they make. Maybe other people will ultimately like it the way I do, so then I will buy. I mean, what you're doing is you've heard that Wall Street is the world's biggest casino, right? And no, it's not entirely a casino because it's not completely random, whereas a, a roulette table is completely random.
Yeah, so in a stock market, if I like a product and I think other people, but then I'll bet if you're basically, yes, it is a bet. You'll bet that other people will feel about it the same way you do, and then you make money on it. Or you bet that a product will fall out of favor and then you short it, right? I mean, so there. You're not just yeah, taking on the whole market saying I'm going to beat it, right? Oh, got Index it. funds yeah. certainly smooth out the volatility of the market. But yeah, oh, by the way, I do give examples of people who are the top 10 earning stock uh, analysts at any given moment, okay? So I, I give, I show the data in the book. So these are people who claim they know what they're doing and they're, they're on another level. They're, they're not saying, oh, I like these sneakers, I'm gonna invest in the sneaker company. They're saying, I'm looking at these analytics, da 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 da. Okay, so. And I'm beating the, and we're beating the market. Yeah, and they're beating, beating the market. Yeah. So you say, yeah. all right. So in the case that I'm describing, these are the people who beat the market uh, this past year, came out on top. So if they're really beating the market, they'll repeat that the next year and the next year. But if it's random in the procedures that they invoke, they won't think of it as random. They think of it as I have expertise that I'm applying here. That's why I'm on top. So watch what happens. Um, so I give the example, you get, you get a, a hundred analysts. No, you get a, a, a thousand analysts, whatever, whatever the number is. It's in the hundreds for sure. Okay. And, and you say, will the market go up or down today? And they say, I pick up. You pick down. Three other people pick up. All right. Tomorrow, what will it do? Up, down. Or... The next day, do you realize that if you start out with a thousand analysts, if they picked at random after 10 days, someone will have picked the market correctly 10 consecutive times. And all the press goes to that person. What were your... What, what did you do? Oh, well, I, I figured that this, and this, I made this calculation and I did this. Okay, how about next year? If their stuff is good, they can repeat this, but they don't. Do you realize only one, I did this for three years in a row, of the top 10 analysts in a given year, and they make it to lists, only one of them made it into the next year's list, and the third year, none of them were there. <laughs> yeah. A whole other set of 10 people. It's very eye-opening. Yeah. I don't see this getting talked about. It's just yeah. I, I I had 10 in a row. Random statistics will generate such a person every single year. And this is so a lot of a lot of the world thrives on our inability to think that way. So, Neil, is there a basic heuristic or or a framework you can give us, me, for or, or some filter to run my thinking through that's that's a little more scientific. And, and, and let me give you some context because, it, and maybe these are two different questions, but I was thinking about when the pandemic hit and all the information that was coming out was new and things were changing on the ground all the time. And during that period, everybody had to pick who we trusted as to the current then truth of things. So my question to you is when we we're pre-consensus, if I could say we were, I, I'm not sure, how should we approach such phenomena? It's very um, good, very important question. So yeah. I can address a couple of elements of it. So one is if we really understood what science is and how and why it works, you would know that if you're eavesdropping on the frontier, on the moving frontier of science, it changes daily. The press doesn't think about it that way, however. They will see a research paper and then report that as the new truth. No, it's not how that works. A research paper, even if it does everything perfectly, may not be correct because there, someone else could find a flaw in it that they didn't know about or the, the wall current shifted or there's something that they didn't see. And so a scientific truth is what's established only after repeated measurements of things. Then you get consistency, and there'll always be outliers, by the way. Statistically, there will always be outliers. But you get enough in the middle there, you say, okay, this is the new truth. Put that in the book and move on. All right. That's how science works. Now, normally, your health doesn't depend on that. It's certainly not in my field does your health depend on whether one of our research results is correct or not. But now we have a health challenge. So what do you do? 
So there's not only how you interact with the moving frontier that changes daily, there's how is that information communicated to the public? And what was clear to me was that the CDC, who should be the ones of singular value to the public in understanding what steps to take, their communication tracks were not as they should have been, okay? What they should have said was, this is a moving target. And every week, there's a different research paper, and we're going to find out whether there's enough confidence in any one research paper for us to go public with that. And Why can't they do advice. that? Is it a political no-no? How no, often no? does a once-in-a-century pandemic happen? Yeah. All right. So, so this, so you can't fault. Yes, you can. I suppose had they thought deeply about it, but it's it's a once in a century thing. And you have lives at stake. So you, and lives are yeah. at stake. So you don't want to withhold something that could keep them alive, waiting for six other research papers to verify it. So you would need a panel of experts looking at each paper, saying, "What's our confidence in this?" Even though we don't have another verifying paper on it, someone will say, "Well." Someone did work on this in another context, and it didn't do well for the people. So we should be more skeptical of this paper than I'm making this up. But it's an example of how you might approach this. That's how they should have done it. Then you don't say to yourself, well, you said this last week, and now you're saying this this week. And then, well, what? So which is it? Well, the fact that, that you happened. even said that meant you were not trained in how to understand the moving frontier of science. The movie Frontier Science is not an anchor of truth. It is a moving picture where the truth you'd expect to emerge in some way as that continues. So there's we as people absent this perspective in our schools. There's the communication tactics of the agency. And with the internet, you have lone wolves out there saying, I'm an MD and you should, I wouldn't put that in my body. And they would say, well, they're an MD. Oh, no, you're, now you're listening to one person. No one scientist is correct about anything unless they are telling you about what has emerged in the consensus of research papers. We, I, I wish I had a different word than consensus because I think the official definition references opinion. but. A scientific consensus is you have research papers that report results, and ideally they do not contain opinion. But if I have eight out of 10 research papers that agree, even mildly on, if not precisely, on a result, I call that a scientific consensus without any reference to opinion at all. I, I need it. We need another word for this, or just broaden the meaning of the word consensus. So with that, that is really good advice, and that's what you should be doing until we have even more information that might embed that truth in some larger truth. I'll give an example to the extent that I know this in detail. The cholesterol-reducing drugs ended up reducing people's risk of heart attacks. The statins, I think they were called. So, I have risk of heart attack, I'm going to take these statins. And we heard word that cholesterol might be bad for you. That Now you read other works that cholesterol might be good for you. Okay, certain kinds of cholesterol. So which is it? Okay, again, you're angry because you want the definitive answer and it's got to be the one answer. What happens is there's a susceptibility of the government to create legislation on single studies. And that should never happen. That should never happen. The pyramid where they have grains at the bottom and meat at the top, the diet pyramid, that kind of should have never happened because they based it on one. It was a big study, but they based it on one study, not multiple studies that emerged a common objective truth out of that. And so it has some flaws that it's gonna be hard to undo because it got blazoned into legislation and food packaging and marketing. So no matter what scientific consensus we arrive at, there will always be outliers. And because we have an internet where if you don't wanna do something, you find an expert who tells you you don't have to do it, and then you just follow their advice. You know, suppose COVID were 50% lethal, instead of low single digits or whatever it turned out to whatever the final numbers were, I'm betting people would have behaved differently. They would have looked more closely, I'm thinking. And mm -hmm. if they didn't, I, we should be trained to do so. So these are the challenges. And yeah, people want to just, or they'll do the research themselves. Really? Like, really? Okay, you need brain surgery today. You're just going to look up a few YouTube videos and then do it? No, because you know neurosurgeons are experts. They're people who devote their lives to this stuff.
and a group of them offers advice, not just one, but a group of them. And you're going to say, no, I did my own work and I, my own homework. And all right, well, we're in our adolescence. I'm a, is it as simple as do your own homework, vet the credentials of where the information is coming from? I, I, well, is hopefully... your homework learn all about it and make your own decision? Or is your homework vet the credentials? No, it's again, it's not about the individual. It's never about the individual because you can always find individuals that can say whatever you want. This is a problem in courts with expert witnesses. It's not about the one witness. It's about the consensus of scientific research and observations. Has it come together in a coherent answer? If the answer is yes, then you've got something. If there's no coherence, then you shouldn't believe anybody. If so no, no, you don't say, what are the credentials? It ain't even about credentials, what school you went to, what journal it was about. No, it's about what is the breadth of the research that goes into it. The National Academy of Sciences specializes in creating just those kinds of reports. Signed into law by Abraham Lincoln in 1863, a year he clearly had other issues on his plate. So what is your take on AI generally? And I'm of the opinion that AI is not going to destroy the world, but like Mark Andreessen, it may in fact save it. But I'm curious as to what you think. Is this another way to to maybe explore space? You know, you know why everyone's talking about AI? Because it crossed over into the world of liberal arts. The rest of us have been using <laughs> AI like for decades. That's Okay, but all of a sudden it can compose your term paper and you lose your shit over that. Okay, uh, you run for the hills and all of a sudden you're thinking about AI. Do you know how many things artificial intelligence are in today? You stopped declaring that Siri is AI because we're all accustomed to that. You can bark into this device thinner than a pack of cigarettes that I want to go to grandma's house the, the, the best way. Okay, let me calculate a route. Well, there's traffic if you go right, so let's go left and go around the bend and come around the other side. Is there a human involved in that? No. Decisions are being made on your behalf by a freaking machine, and it's not rote. Computers are very good at doing rote things. When it's making decisions based on information it is acquiring that involves no, in, no human beings, that's AI period. Now, is it artificial general AI where it learns from its own mistakes? That's another level. Sure. Okay. But AI as a computer making decisions and helping me make my decisions, that's been around forever. Not forever, but for decades. In my field, it's got to do something extra than that for it to be thought of as intelligence. We've been having neural nets in my field help us reduce data that was of a volume too large or the volume too large to reduce and to then interpret. So we have computers helping us interpret data. So this has been going on. So now all of a sudden it composed your term paper. I'm saying, all right, deal with it. <laughs> That's all. <awful. laughs> it's freaky. As soon as it becomes conversational, people, you know, freak out, you know. As as... Yeah, the liberal arts people freaked out. And anytime <laughs> computers got smarter, I said, great. Let's have it do the thing I'm doing, and I'll think of something else to do. Now I don't have to do it. They should line up all the things that people have to write that no one signs their name to, like instruction manuals or <laughs> things. <that laughs> let AI do it. So can we go to the movies? So first of all, like, are you like a difficult person to go to the movies? You know who like the difficult person is at the movie? It's the person who read the book first. <laughs> they should just not go to the theater that's, because, that's, oh, this didn't happen in the book. Oh, they, the character <laughs> development. Just stay the hell out of the theater. Okay. I'm there. Oh, I totally enjoy a film. Okay. Doesn't mean I, I'm I can see you about, saying, well, that's not how a wormhole works. But well, in my head, so, I, don't, I don't tell you that unless you ask. <laughs> so are you a sci fi? I like a, a good big, high right. budget sci science fiction All right. extravaganza. Yes. I, ju I just, I got to ask, what's your favorite sci fi movie? Then? That would be different from what would be the most scientifically accurate. I would say my True. favorite movie, Contact. Is there a time travel movie that, I, guess, I don't know how to ask this question, more accurate? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Back to the Future. To do they tell. thought more about well, time travel than any other movie. Get I've out. Ever seen. No way. Back to the Future 1. Thought more about time travel than any movie I've ever seen. Just I'll give one example. You have to be like totally in on the movie on this. So Marty goes to the mall to film Doc 
Brown test his right. time machine. In the parking lot. That's in right. In the parking lot. And you see a time clock next to him at the top of the, the, the ravine there. And it says 1.15 or something in the morning. And it says Twin Pines Mall. And it shows two Twin Pines there. That's the name of the mall. Well, why is that the name of the mall? Well, most mall, many malls are named for the farm that used to be there before it became a mall. So when Marty is chased by the terrorists and he goes back in time, he goes back in time exactly 30 years from 1985, the year of the film, to 1955. And he lands in Twin Pines Ranch. Now, this being America, if you show up on someone's ranch in a DeLorean, what does the farmer do? He gets a gun. He gets the shotgun. Okay. <laughs> this is America. Okay. Duh. That's what he does. All right. So then he gets out his gun and he chases Marty off the property. But while he's driving off the property, there are two tiny pine trees that are sitting there inside a tiny picket fence. This farmer cares about his two pine trees. It's called Twin Pines Ranch. He's got the two pines in his front lawn. There's a picket fence around him. Marty drives over one of them, quickly escaping the shotgun blasts. Now there's only one pine tree there. You don't even notice it. It just happens. At the end of the movie, when he returns to his time, they recreate the scene where he runs to, to Doc Brown. He's now recreating that scene. And there's the sign there with the time as 1.20 a.m. And it says Lone Pine Mall. So it's congruency that This that is freaking brilliant. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's not just an Easter egg. It's how much they thought about the causes and effects of the timeline. In the book, you talk about Earth and the universe of giant killing machines. And, and it's juxtaposed on the, the beauty of Earth and the universe. And it made me think about some extinction level event in, in our future. And one of the questions popped up for me is how soon prior to, if there was a meteor strike that we could pick up uh, and know that it would be head to earth, how soon prior to that would we find out or could we know with, with our current technology? Well, the good thing about species extincting asteroids is that they're the biggest among them, which makes them easier to detect. So. What's a little more pernicious, I think that's the right word, is the smaller ones, of which there are many more. And the smaller ones we might not be able to defend against, but they would have the energy to easily obliterate a city. Uh, a city would be a goner. But fortunately, most of Earth's surface is not covered by city. It's covered by ocean and then by uninhabited swaths of land. So we need to think about all the kinds of asteroids that could harm us. So there is no large asteroid that could put the species extinct that we see on the horizon. But you want to be able to protect against it, even if you don't see one yet. And we, we, we currently don't have that ability. We're sitting ducks. You write about and talk about having a forbidden Twitter file. Oh, my gosh. I'm so, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I hope somewhere you're collecting all this and you'll publish it when you... So have no, because it, it's it's a I put it in the forbidden Twitter file because it would just upset people, and that's not my goal. You know, not all truths need to be shared. Yeah, but you just, don't know. You, you I mean, the, the, you no, you I do. Oh, I do. A good idea. <laughs> no, you know how I know. <laughs> you have because a good idea that yeah that I some post of, tweets and I watch people's responses to them. I know how they're going to react. That is my access neurosynaptic snapshot of how people react to every word I put to page. If I think a joke is funny and nobody's laughing, it's not funny, all right? If I think something's clever and no one thinks it's clever, it's not clever. This is my feedback loop. So yeah, if I think it would upset people, I know it will upset people. Neil, thank you so much for, for coming on, man. I, I really appreciate it. This is fantastic. Okay, uh, well, excellent. Thank you for your interest. Now, I like speaking to audiences that are not sort of your standard uh, science geek communities. And so I'm, I'm delighted to to be in your house with you. Run for president, man. Please. No. <laughs> Come on. No, that implies you can swap out one leader, put in another, then all will be well. When there's the matter of the people who voted for the person you just took out, they're still out there. So the New York Times once asked me, if I were president, what would I do? This is in one of these periods of impasses in Congress and government seemed to be broken. And they wanted to get opinions from different walks of life. 
So if you put a link in the, for that, it's if I were president, my first line is if I were president, I wouldn't be president. <laughs> that's, the, that's, <laughs> that's my first line. Then I go on and explain why. Oh, no, you can't leave me hanging, Neil. No, you go, go see it. It's in. It's right. online. Okay. All it's right. online. <laughs> but it comes down to the fact that is the president someone who follows the will of the electorate or who leads it? If they follow the will of the electorate, then you should have no gripe against any politician because they're just doing what their electorate wants them to. And that's what's supposed to happen in a, in a democracy or in a republic such as ours. So I think leaders are in a democracy are overrated for their influence on the world. It's still the matter of the people who voted for them. What message do you have for them? And that's really what it comes down to. Neil, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. All right, it. good. Okay. Look you again. Bye. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Cheers. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com. And we will talk again soon. Mm-hmm.